Yeah. You don't have the interpreter, is that okay? Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, this morning, I traveled with Adjutant General Quinn to the community of Shelby in Toole County to visit on the ground efforts uh, to mitigate the situation there. Was briefed by the hospital uh, CEO, the chief medical officer, the county public health officer, and others. And in taking necessary safety precautions, we also visited with staff at Marias Medical Center, as well as Heritage Assisted Living Center, uh, and we visited with them outside the facilities. Also had the opportunity to meet with uh, Sheriff Witt, as well as the county commissioners. Finally, I also had the opportunity or chance to see the National Guard's mission in action, both visiting with Air Guard members who are working at the Heritage Center and also National Guard soldiers as they're screening passengers disembarking from the train station. Left with any number of observations from that trip, um, First, the recognition that in large communities and small, that this impacts every facet of a community. And it's also amazing the community support and ways the communities come together. And having a little open forum with uh, the hospital staff of how appreciative they are of flowers being delivered, of the recognition in windows all across the town of people in Shelby recognizing that the healthcare providers are working hard each and every day to keep not only those in need of healthcare safe, but indeed the entire community. Also underscored continuing concerns about the needs for supplies and the challenges of that. And those are things we'll continue to work on uh, each and every day. The topic of modeling, and as people are looking at various models from around the country and trying to say, this is exactly what's happening in Montana, certainly has been a conversation in recent days and weeks. I've asked uh, Dr. Greg Holzman, the state's chief medical officer, to share with you today how we use modeling to guide us in our work and in our decision making, but importantly, uh, why we don't rely solely on modeling. And I understand that uh, this is a time of uncertainty, particularly for Montana families across our state, whose lives look different than they did a month ago. I understand that so many are also experiencing economic and financial hardships particularly those who've been laid off or who have had to take leaves of absence from their jobs. And I understand it's easy to turn to modeling, especially the ones that give us that most optimistic look as uh, we all search for answers and a better understanding of, of this virus, how long it may last and how much worse it could get. I certainly want to open back up non-essential businesses and operations as soon as we can. I want us to be able to celebrate the lives that we've saved together with our healthcare workers, rather than just howling for our healthcare heroes from our doorsteps each night. I want to return to as much normalcy as possible, as much as you all do as well. That's why we're taking the steps now, so we can make this a reality as soon as we can. Modelings are predictions on what we do now. Our modelings are predictions on what we do now, but it's what we do now that's going to make the real difference on what actually happens. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Holzman. Thank you, Governor. Um, two major points I kind of want to get across on modeling. The strength of one's model is dependent on the understanding of the science of the current situation. And with COVID-19, a lot is still unknown or only partially known. The second part of modeling 
is that modeling does not predict the future. It helps us describe possibilities of what could happen depending on what interventions we implement today. COVID-19 modeling are based on many assumptions. We do not know all the science and we are learning more and more each day. For example, how transmittable is this virus? What is the severity or virulence of the virus? How does it affect different populations? And we can go on and on and on. This information is very important. And when we don't know all the facts, we try to use our best scientific assumptions with that data that we do have. Let me give you an example. You may have heard the term r not. The basic definition of r not is the number of cases an average, on average an infected person will cause during the, their infectious period. So how many other people will that individual infect? A virus may be very infectious, like measles, which has a very high r not, or lower, like influenza. But the r not does not describe the, the whole thing on the virus. It also depends on the population it is spreading in. Measles is very infectious, but in the United States, most individuals are vaccinated, and thus it greatly decreases the spread of this disease. We have other issues around measles, but that will be a discussion for another time. Flu is not as infectious as measles, but we see more spread of that in the United States because one, fewer people are vaccinated against the flu, and this virus can easily mutate, thus allowing another way for the virus to kind of dodge our immune system. The point being here is that the r not, the infectability, is not a stable number. It depends on many factors, and when in, in epidemiology terms, we are always trying to get the r not below 1. That's when we stop the spread of the disease. So returning to the discussion of our modeling, once we make guesstimates on these type of variables, such as the r not, we run the models through different scenarios. But with the models, we need to make assumptions here also. For example, we, want to, we might want one possible outcome is if social distancing is in place and we'd look at another one as if social distancing is not in place, or if it's partially in place. This gives us data and ideas of what could happen. From the state's perspective, with many different assumptions being put in place on the different COVID-19 models, it is important that we do not rely on one model, as no one model is complete, completely correct. We look at many different models. We also look at our own epidemiological data that is coming in new each and every day, and we talk to providers that are on the front line. We use all this information and more to help us make short-term and longer-term plans. And we continue to modify these plans as we learn more about the virus and the success of different preventive measures. It is important to acknowledge there are variables in modeling that we cannot control the virulence or the severity or harmfulness of the virus. However, there is a lot we can control, such as social distancing, wearing your cloth mask uh, when social distancing might not be able to occur, washing your hands frequently, trying not to touch your face, that's one I find difficult to do at times and have to keep reminding myself, cleaning common touch surfaces and others that we have talked about. While we are all doing our best to prevent the spread of the virus and protect ourselves and our neighbors from COVID-19, medical providers and local and state public health are also helping us control the virus. Providers in the state lab are notifying local public health partners regarding individuals who are sick with COVID-19. So we can move quickly to make sure those individuals who are sick are isolated and those who have been exposed are quarantined. We want to stop the spread of the virus before we, they have exponential growth of the virus within any one community. Where the pandemic goes in Montana is dependent on us. I would like to emphasize once again, modeling does not predict the future. It, it helps explain possibilities of what could happen depending on what we do or don't do today. I'd like to hand over uh, the microphone to Jim Murphy, who is the Chief of the Communicable Disease and Control and Prevention Bureau here at the state. And he can describe how it works on the ground and how 
the epidemiologist and state and local public health are working together to try to stop the spread of this virus and protect Montanans, especially those at higher risk for bad outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. So I was asked to explain a little bit about how the local process works after a case of COVID-19 gets reported. I think it's important to acknowledge that COVID-19 is something that's new, but it is a reportable disease in Montana. As soon as a disease report comes in to the local or state health department, um, it gets immediately evaluated to figure out a few things. One is the local public health nurses are really the folks on the ground that do a lot of the, the hard work to try to find out where this infection came from. So each case gets investigated to find out three things. One is, where do we think this person acquired the infection? For instance, we know that a lot of our early cases were travel associated, imported into the state of Montana. The second thing that the public health nurses try to find out is, when that person interfaced with the medical systems in Montana, was anybody in the medical systems placed at risk? That's a very important step to help break the chain of transmission. The third thing, and probably the most labor intensive part of this investigation is to try to figure out who are the close contacts that may have been placed at risk from the person that we are investigating. All of that gets rolled up and the local health department then goes out and works with the close contacts involved and the case to control the spread of the disease. For instance, the case is put in what we call isolation. If we're fortunate, that person will be isolated in their homes until they're deemed no longer a health risk to anybody and then they're released after recovery and they can go about their business without any worry of spread. We do have some people that are isolated in the hospital because of their requirements for hospitalization. Fortunately, we've been able to avoid that in almost every case. The next thing they will do is work with the close contacts. These are people who we think spent enough time or were in close enough proximity to the person that was diagnosed that they are at risk. Those close contacts are then quarantined. Quarantine right now lasts for 14 days after your last exposure. During that time, those people are asked to remain low, not go to work, not place other people at risk, and during that entire period, they're also monitored for any change in their signs or symptoms. Any change in their signs or symptoms will immediately lead to a medical evaluation that might include COVID-19 testing. That's the only way that we're going to be able to break the chain of transmission is by identifying people who are cases, looking at the people that they placed at risk, then identifying those people if they convert to cases. That's the work that is going on at the local level. In some cases, we get very fortunate, and a case might have literally zero to two or three contacts that have to be followed up at the local level. The case of somebody that is returning from um, international travel that gets back to Montana, not feeling good, stays home, they might literally have zero close contacts for us to follow up after we uh, investigate that case. In the more extreme cases, we might end up with somebody that has 30 close contacts that need to follow up and monitoring. And that's where the, the, the steps can get really in, intense for a local health department to keep up with that. These steps, though, are important for people to be able to uh, be assured that we're not putting other people at risk and that local and state health departments are doing everything that they can to protect the general public out there. It's very important to remind healthcare providers that we work with that we are interested in testing anybody that has signs or symptoms of COVID-19 infection. The state public health laboratory has the resources to test anybody that a clinician feels is at risk and looks like they have clinically compatible illness. Again, this is the only way that we're going to be able to interrupt the chain of transmission. And we're making a lot of progress on that. And we really have the local public health departments out there and the clinicians to thank for that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Holzman, and thank you, Jim. Uh, finally, before I open up for uh, questions of either me or Dr. Holzman or Jim Murphy, um, I want to acknowledge again that this is a really difficult time uh, for families. And right now, parents are having to explain the many recent changes and challenges in their children's lives. I certainly understand that as a father of three kids, simple things like watching our kids compete in sporting events 
can almost seem like we used to take it for granted. And I think even our younger kids who are trying to figure all this out are often that much harder hit. A uh, parent relayed to me recently that their 10-year-old, she asked the parents, like, I can't believe my birthday was taken away uh, by our governor. Um, I think it's really especially important in times like this that we do remember to try to find ways to bring joy and goodness into our homes. We have to look for that goodness that surrounds us in each day all throughout this. And while we can't lift uh, the shelter in place for a child's birthday party, uh, know that if any parent wants to email in at governor at mt.gov, that the governor, or I and the lieutenant governor, will send out a little video uh, wishing your child a happy birthday. And in light of this weekend, I'm also issuing a directive providing that certain magical creatures may travel throughout Montana to perform essential services. M magical entities certainly do perform services outside of the scope of human ability. The tradition of Easter egg hunts, as an example, has been celebrated by generations of Montanans. I remember as a young child rushing onto this lawn, hoping to find that golden egg, and then remember bringing my kids to the Easter egg hunts as well. I think we could all recognize that the Easter Bunny does perform essential services of hiding Easter eggs, supporting the chocolate egg industry, bringing springtime joy to Montanans all over the state. Further, all dental services, including magical ones, are considered essential services, especially during a time of increased consumption of chocolate eggs, yellow peeps, other related spring treats. The Tooth Fairy is uniquely qualified to perform the service of lost tooth collection to remit payment for lost baby teeth. So under that directive, magical entities, including but not limited to the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy, may freely travel into and through Montana to perform services essential to Montanans. Additionally, they may leave behind a gift, for example, eggs, chocolates, fair market value of a baby tooth at every home they visit, and they must follow social distancing guidelines. Uh, I've spoken with the Easter Bunny, who's agreed to adhere to social distancing requirements this weekend. We'll be limiting the hiding of eggs and treats to within households in the immediate yards of households. I know I'll be asked what type of authority I have to do this. It's pretty simple. Esther Watkins Arnold, the Tooth Fairy from 1927, and the Velveteen Rabbit uh, from 1922, and all Montana children, uh, young and young at heart. So for those of you uh, young at heart tuning in today, I hope you do remember to find joy in each day, to try to look for the goodness around us, uh, even in these times. Now I'll turn it over for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, you can press five star, not star five, Phil Drake. <laughs> you'll be notified that your hand is raised. When we unmute your phone, you'll be notified uh, that you've been called on to ask a question. So, any questions? First one question. Hi, Troy. So I, I hope we've, we're ahead of it, but to be completely honest, probably not. Uh, we need to follow out the numbers a little bit farther and see where things go. There's also, while the lab data that we get from our own lab here at the state is very quickly turned around, uh, lab data that goes out or testing that goes out to some of the private labs 
uh, we might not get the results back as quickly. Hopefully they are getting to us as quickly as possible. So I think we need to follow it a little bit longer and see where, where things are, are going. We also need to, as Jim Murphy mentioned, really encourage our providers to continue to test. Um, and this will allow us to do the contact tracing and hopefully we are beyond the curve, but I think we need to, per we need to move forward as if we're not yet. Next question. Hey, Tristan. Yeah, and, and Tristan, maybe I'll turn it over to Dr. Holzman, but I would also say, yeah, look, and I'm both reading and looking into, as experts around the country say, how do we reopen this? I mean, it's all also even based on your question, the assumptions of an antibody test um, being successful and being approved. I don't know if you have anything more to add, Dr. Holzman. Mm -hmm. I agree with the, the governor. There's a lot of assumptions here. There's even some uh, places within Montana that are looking at the on a, antibody testing uh, to see how effective it would be and, and trying to figure out the right uh, tests that could be used. The concept of the antibody testing is to show who has already been inf infected by this virus and thus must might have immunity. So I think there's still a lot more to learn on that. It would be a great tool if we do have it available and we start to learn how long that immunity might be of, um, how long an individual might have immunity after being infected with this virus. So lots still to learn, a lot of assumptions that we're taking on, but I'm glad the research uh, folks are, do are looking at this and it would be a great tool to have. Another phone question. Well, and I'll, Jim can answer it. So, so what, what it's been is signs or symptoms of COVID-19 and either direct contact with COVID positive or traveling of an area of concern. Yeah. Go ahead. Eric, I think just to clarify, you know, when testing first became available, because testing availability was an issue, the early recommendations from CDC were concentrating on hospitalized patients. It quickly evolved from that point uh, to where we do have adequate testing now to test people who have symptoms of concern. If a clinician feels that um, they should be tested, we have the ability to do that. Now, CDC does have some priorities for this, that if we have to prioritize because of volume, um, for instance, at the state laboratory, we would concentrate on the higher risk patients or the hospitalized patients. But fortunately, the state lab has been able to keep up with demand, and we haven't had to make those difficult decisions right now. So a clinician that wants to test somebody who is symptomatic can order that test, and we encourage them to do so. Correct. Symptoms right now, if they look like they're clinically compatible with COVID-19, are enough to warrant testing because we have transmission in many communities in Montana. So this would be the prudent thing to do so that we can interrupt the chain of transmission. Next question. Uh, yeah, and I did just get, get the letter and look, we have to make sure that those people are sheltered at home, that they have a place to be in their home. And to be clear, even when we made that directive, 
This doesn't excuse anyone from pain. And there should be an expectation that everyone does pay their rent and pays their rent on time. Uh, we'll continue though to then even have discussions with folks in the landlord side. I mean, we know that businesses, affected businesses, including landlords, could be eligible for um, SBA relief, also with federally backed mortgages, may be eligible for relief under the CARES Act, but we'll continue to, to talk to the landlords. And anyone that is a tenant, well, during this time, it's the directive says you cannot be evicted. That doesn't relieve you if you have the ability uh, to pay your rent. There's another phone question. Oh, this is Holly. Can you hear me? I can, Holly. Awesome. Thanks for giving this call. Um, I wanted to ask about testing capacity again. Um, I'm on a call today earlier um, with a different elected official, and a reporter asked a question. And she was talking about in her county, you know, there's not a medical facility. And you know, there's some counties in Montana that just have one testing site that might be no longer as for people to get to. And some some counties in Montana haven't done any testing, haven't reported that they've tested anyone yet. I'm wondering if you have any concerns that we're not capturing some of those people who might be symptomatic, but just aren't able to get tested, and if there's any discussion about making sure we're capturing those people. Well, I do have concerns that someone that's symp symptomatic wherever they are may not get tested. And it, I think one of the things, Holly, I mean, the question underscores some of the challenges of looking at the county by county data. Like we even know here in Lewis and Clark County, at times someone from Broadwater County might be tested here. But uh, do encourage all avenues for individuals that are symptomatic to actually reach out to a health care provider and try to arrange to have a test. Another phone question. Yeah, so, so a couple things, Chris. Uh, Montana now is to get or just recently received 15 Abbott fast test machines. Now, recognizing that these machines can, you know, get a result in literally like five minutes, the whole scale can go up to 15 minutes, but it's also one where um, it's a lower volume test, you know, like when where we can batch test uh, literally hundreds at the state lab, that ends up um, the ability to only do effectively one at a time. We also have a good number of machines in Montana that in many healthcare, both hospitals and some of clinics that can be upgraded to run the Abbott tests. So we're going to figure out the best way to deploy those tests, but also like I was on a call with governors just yesterday, and this has been not just from the governors, but someone talked to directly the folks, the head of Abbott. While we have these machines, um, there's no expectation of any significant amount of the testing kits until the end of the year. So each one of these machines, or I'm sorry, until the end of the month. Each one of these machines um, were shipped with 24 tests. And with those 24 tests, a good handful of them are needed initially to calibrate uh, the machine. So we dropped off one of the Abbott fast test machines up in Shelby today, but it'll still be several weeks before we get sufficient numbers of the testing kits so that these could be meaningfully utilized. Another phone question. Another phone question. Hi, this is Nikki Willette from Yellowstone Public Radio. Thanks so much for holding the call today. Sure, Nikki. Um, earlier, earlier this week, you, um, you broke down kind of the racial demographics of people who have tested positive, and I'm curious now how close 
of contact are you with the Indian Health Service regarding their testing? And um, what are you hearing from tribal leaders about how the implementation of the CARES Act relief is going? Dr. Holtzman, do you want to talk about the contacts with Indian Health Services? Yeah, I, I can. Or, Jim, or Jim. We both, um, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I, I think it's a very good question. We work closely at the State Health Department with our partners at Tribal Health Departments and with Indian Health Service. We have been doing a lot of testing on behalf of Indian Health Service at the State Laboratory. So I think that we've got a pretty representative sample of what's going on in all corners of Montana, including Indian Country. Fortunately, right now we've seen um, a, a lower impact in Indian Country. We're watching that really closely trying to make sure they have access to all of the resources that we can give them for testing, as well as PPE or personal protective equipment. So, so far things look pretty good there, but it's something we have to continue to watch close and make sure that services are offered in those settings. We don't have that specific information. Um, it, it gets a little bit of challenging we'll, to, to look at that because people can get the test elsewhere but live in a different county. Uh, I, Governor Bullock kind of explained this really well with uh, Helena being where we're situated, very close to Jefferson and Broadwater County. Uh, this is where you see some of our um, numbers go out wrong the first time where we've said a, a case was in one county and then found out it was in another is because the test happened in Lewis and Clark possibly and the person actually was living in another county. So we don't have those specific numbers that are, are reliable to um, reliable f for putting out at this time. Another phone question. Yeah, and Marisa, we will talk to landlords to try to figure out actually, you know, the, the best solution along the way as we do in every step of it, that uh, when it comes to property taxes, the vast majority, like over 80% of it goes to the local level. Local jurisdictions have the ability to waive any penalties um, for late payment, but that's up to the local jurisdictions. Another phone question. Hi, this is Phil Drake. Hi, Phil. Five star. I mean, they're not adjoining facilities, but there are individuals that end up from one facility to the other. Um, there isn't a directive like this was the individual or where it exactly started, but while they're separate facilities in different areas, that there is at times both patients between one or the other and at times staff. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, obviously the change to testing being made, are, is your office um, concerned that this is going to suddenly lead to, I mean, or maybe not concerned, but think that this might lead to a much larger number of positive tests here in Montana, specifically around Gallatin County? Look, I, I would love for the ability, I mean, the more testing that we can receive, even if it ends up increasing the numbers, uh, the better we have our hands around the impact of this virus and also the potential that this virus 
is being spread by community acquisition as the local health departments do their job. So um, I, like every member of the media, like every Montanan or many Montanans, look at those numbers of COVID-19 positive each and every day. We try in our own minds ascertain, ascertain here are the trends. But I also recognize it, and I think that is one of the reasons why if someone is symptomatic, they should certainly go to a health care provider to get tested. Because the greater information that we have about this, the sooner we're going to make sure, first of all, um, well, the sooner that we're going to really get our arms around it. And also recognizing that one of the challenges of this is like when you see a, here are the numbers from today. Well, that could be a transmission that had happened 10 days ago. So we're always sort of chasing yesterday's actions. But that's, again, why it's so important from my perspective to adhere to the social distancing guidelines and directives. And it is so important also so we can do the contact tracing of individuals that are positive and work our way backwards that if you are symptomatic, that you should seek out a test. Final phone question. Another phone question. Hi, Kathy. I can. Well, there isn't as much, like I know that there were 24,000 payments between March 29th, April 5th, and 20,000 unemployment insurance claims. So we have brought both additional staff into uh, our Department of Labor and are doing everything possible that we can to meet what are significant demands. And I have another question. I, right, for you, okay. I certainly hope not that it doesn't happen in Anaconda or anywhere else, but that's, again, sort of underscores some of the reasons why we need to do everything we can, like if you, if you are symptomatic, to get tested. And if you are um, feeling even symptomatic, to self-quarantine until you can. And it, it is one that, look, we are a state where... Um, at least before this pandemic, there would be a lot of interaction between individuals, not just, you know, at assisted living facility, but at any number of areas. So certainly there's nothing uh, that we've seen out of Anaconda to date that would suggest that, but that concern is for every single community across the state. Please. Uh, Governor, um, came out of the Economic Affairs Committee this morning, 64,000 Montanans are currently applying or accepting unemployment. How long can Montana afford to keep making those payments? Well, I, th I think f from my perspective, the unemployment insurance payments, I mean, that was one of the first things that we did and got rid of the first week, uh, or having to wait a week's delay. Um, my principal concern right now is making sure that if someone's been furloughed or laid off from a job, that we can do everything that we can to actually get them those payments. And haven't looked at as far as duration of the pandemic and overall long-term economic impacts. But it also underscores uh, one of the reasons why trying to take in consultation with healthcare professionals and others a measured approach of saying we're only going to be doing our statewide directives in two week periods because I'd love to open up our state and indeed free our economy as soon as we can. 
Yes, sir. Who's against um, face masks from the federal government? You know how soon that will come in? So, uh, yeah, there, there are. So the expectation is now that uh, the 80,000, there's about 70,000 more uh, N95 face masks from uh, FEMA or from the Strategic National Stockpile. We've been told now that they will be coming. Some may even be coming uh, this week. So I had been told earlier that they would have arrived. I think it, that was near the end of March. Uh, but I heard from the FEMA regional administrator today and he's doing a great job in a challenging situation that we should get those, the additional 70,000 soon. Uh, I'd also note that, you know, just by surveying hospitals and DES needs out there right now that like the request from them to us is about 490,000. So certainly appreciate those efforts, just like I appreciated the efforts of North Dakota to give us 50,000 masks, as I appreciate the efforts of the Red Cross, American Red Cross to get us 10,000 masks. And we're working each and every day to try to get the medical supplies that individuals need. I mean, it underscores to me where, when I'm up at the Shelby Hospital and speaking to the providers, they say, yeah, supplies, even things like the basic toweling, toilet paper, some of those supply chains have broken down for the hospital. So we're in constant discussion with the healthcare providers, what they need and working to try to figure out distribution chains to work through what is unfortunately a somewhat broken system right now. Would, hey, please. Would you say um, it's safe for the public to assume that there are more cases than confirmed? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, from the perspective of that the only way that we know someone is COVID positive is to get tested and it's confirmed. Now, I also recognize that for the um, 354 cases that we have to date, how many tests have we run? 8,000. Uh, so that, yes, yeah, certainly I, I would be pleasantly surprised, indeed astonished, if at the end of today, of the 436 tests that we run, if all of them were negative. So we will continue to see COVID-19 positive tests. And it underscores, again, the reasons why we need to take all of these actions to minimize that and to flatten the curve. I know things are changing every day, but um, have you considered extending closures for schools and businesses at this point? So we just extended it as of yesterday. They were set, set to expire on Friday to April 24th. So haven't done anything since yesterday. Do you have a re-evaluating of It's a consistent time and time again. Um, I mean, both listen to public health officials and others to decide what steps we should be taking. Great. Well, thank you very much.